Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is David Victor. I'm a professor of innovation and public policy at UC San Diego and a non-resident um, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to this event on clean energy investments in emerging and developing countries. Um, it, it's hard to imagine a more important topic. Uh, deep decarbonization is a capital intensive activity. It's really about investment. Uh, essentially, all the expected growth and emissions uh, uh, of greenhouse gases uh, is likely to come from emerging and developing countries, at least on current trajectories right now. Uh, yet last year, we saw a decline in clean energy investment in those countries. And so fi figuring that problem out, how to attract capital, especially private capital, into this domain is, is centrally important. Uh, we have a terrific panel for you today. We're going to hear first from Bati Barol, who's the executive director of the International Energy Agency and ICON in the study of energy policy and modeling of energy policy issues has been at IEA for a long time, was at OPEC before that. Uh, other honors in his name include since 2013, he's been an honorary life member of the Galatasaray Football Club, very important football club in Istanbul. Um, and Spati is gonna talk with us today about results from a IEA report that came out about two weeks ago, just under two weeks ago about clean energy investment in emerging and developing countries. Um, IEA has really helped set the tune in this area. Um, and so it's really our pleasure to have Bhatti with us. Bhatti's gonna make some brief opening remarks. I'm gonna have a discussion with him and then we're gonna go to a panel discussion after that and I'll introduce the panelists then. But right now, Fatih, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, first of all, for organizing this uh, uh, meeting and to all the colleagues who are with us uh, today. And I am very much looking forward to hear the comments and suggestions for our future work. Uh, David, we have uh, made, in fact, in the last uh, three months, three uh, reports, which I call uh, a trilogy. Uh, and these are not uh, by chance, uh, the three reports. One of them is at the center, is the how the roadmap to net zero roadmap to 1.5, what needs to happen in the global energy sector to bring the global emissions to net zero by 2050. So this is, we published on 18th of May, and uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, things to talk about that uh, report, what needs to be done and when, and what are the implications. But in addition to this report, we had two other uh, uh, reports, which were also impactful. One of them was to look at the critical minerals. Where are we today? Where are we going tomorrow? Because uh, this report shows that if we go to a net zero world, the demand for certain critical minerals uh, will increase from seven to 15 times compared to now and 2050. What are those? Lithium, platinum, cobalt, copper, many of them and their availability and the, uh, the ge uh, geopolitical implications are an issue in case they are not available at a price which is affordable, in case there are energy security uh, issues which are not addressed, they may slow down the clean energy transition. So we made this report and came up with some uh, suggestions there, which you will see in a few months of time, uh, some of the governments around the world will take some necessary measures there. And the, the third report of the trilogy, Net Zero report, the Critical Minerals report, and third one is the one we discussed today. This is uh, financing clean energy transition in emerging and developing uh, economies. My colleagues, uh, Mike Waldron and Tim Gould, uh, with a big team, uh, uh, put together this report with the support from uh, the uh, working together with World Bank and the uh, World Economic uh, Forum. And I am thankful to our advisory uh, board uh, here, uh, several distinguished economists uh, around the world, including you, uh, David. Thank you very much for your great uh, suggestions. Uh, we made this report. So why did we make this report? For the following reason. When I look at the world uh, today, uh, the, if you exclude uh, uh, China, two thirds of uh, the global population in this emerging and developing world, this is number one. Number two, 
in the next two decades, more than 90% of the emissions growth come from these countries, yet only one fifth of the clean energy investments go there. So this is a big, big, big uh, uh, problem. And this imbalance is a major alarm bell, uh, I uh, believe. If we are not able to mobilize clean energy investment in those countries, uh, we will see continuation of emissions uh, growth, which means in turn what we do in the United States or in Europe or I don't know, other countries, the global effect will be uh, rather uh, uh, limited. And as such, for me, uh, David, if I can take one, summarize with one line, it is a major fault line in our fight against uh, uh, climate change, the, the, uh, the uh, lack of investment uh, there. Just to give you an order of uh, magnitude, the, today the clean energy investments in those countries are about 150 billion US dollars, according to our numbers. And in order to have a net zero world, these investments need to increase by a factor of seven, about one trillion, from 150 billion today to one trillion, so that the world can reach its climate targets. Is it possible? I don't know. But when we look at the global capital, there is, there is no shortage of global capital, whether or not money will meet the clean energy investment projects in the emerging and developing world is a question. I believe money, capital will meet the clean energy projects in North America, in Europe, with some difficulties, but in those countries, it will happen or not, uh, I do not uh, know, and we hope that it will happen. It is the reason we made this uh, report. In the report, we look at more than 50 case studies, one by one, in Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, in Colombia, from geothermal projects to efficiency, efficiency to grids, solar. What are the difficulties for these projects to see the light of the day? What kind of challenges and what kind of lessons we can learn so that governments uh, put the right policy framework there? This is one of the, in my view, two major conditions to go from 150 to 1 trillion. The other one is that the, uh, there is a need, in my view, an urgent need for the international financial institutions take a, the a, a mobilizing clean energy investments in emerging uh, world as a strategic priority. And uh, they, uh, the countries, in the board of this uh, international financial institutions uh, give this mandate to those uh, uh, financial institutions. The problem is, uh, David, the, most of the, those projects are uh, at the upfront, they require a lot of, the, uh, the uh, cost of capital is very high in the upfront, but then afterwards, the uh, operating costs are rather uh, cheap, sometimes close to zero. But since the, uh, compared to North America and Europe, in many of those countries, the cost of capital is much higher, in our, according to our numbers, about up to seven times higher uh, than the uh, advanced economies. There is a need for such a catalyst role for uh, those uh, 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 international financial institutions to play. And in my view, in addition to this, when we look at the historical emissions as well, I believe the advanced economies have a, a moral responsibility to support the uh, advanced uh, the emerging countries' clean energy transitions. Let me finish by uh, saying uh, uh, here, uh, uh, Dave, that the, I, I mean, we all talk about the race to uh, zero, which is uh, extremely uh, true. And uh, in my view, race is not uh, between the countries, but against time. And we should acknowledge that some countries start this race in front of the others. Advanced economies start in front of the others, and the emerging countries come behind. Uh, 
and the nature of the problem, and you know this better than uh, me, uh, uh, David, unless all the countries uh, crosses the finish line, nobody wins the race. So this is important that the uh, race is only won if we all uh, uh, finish the uh, race. And in that respect, I believe uh, financing clean energy investment in the emerging world is a top priority. And as such, given the current numbers today, it is a major fault line uh, in our fight against climate change. And I stop uh, here, uh, David. Great. Well, thank you very much. I, we're going to hear a little more about the report in detail from your colleague, uh, Mike Waldron, in a little bit. But I want to just take a few minutes and ask you a couple of high level strategic questions because you've had this view of a uh, strategic view of the whole industry for, for quite a while. It seems like the number seven is a theme that runs through the report. We need a roughly seven times increase in investment in clean energy in emerging developing countries. And your report's not focused on China, it's, it's ch China aside, aside for that. And the cost of capital are up to seven times greater. So one of the things the report does is lay out a whole bunch of different policies that, that need to be done, adopted internally and externally and so on. A lot of moving parts. What in your view are the one or two things that really matter the most in terms of unlocking this capital that's sitting out there uh, ready to flow to, into the places where it needs to flow. Yeah, uh, David, today I talk with some uh, colleagues in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in South Africa, and I gave them a number, which in fact, it is really striking or heartbreaking, whatever you say. And the, uh, the colleagues were in, in, in London, in the UK, they, we were talking from there. Now, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the by far uh, the continent which gets the highest amount of solar. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the entire solar installed capacity is five gigawatts. And in the UK, it is three times 15 gigawatts. I mean, this is the, you will all agree with me uh, that even uh, Rachel, who is, who is English, that the Sub-Saharan Africa, there is more sun in, in the UK. This is, there is, uh, I think it is undisputable. And uh, you have, 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa who don't have access to electricity. Why? What can we do? What is our report? I see two things. One, there are good examples, for example, in India, uh, in, in Ghana, in, uh, in, in Vietnam, how to, what kind of simple, straightforward investment framework uh, to be uh, put together. And we are working with some of those countries to provide a, a investor friendly a, a, a regulatory framework. This is one thing. But the second, and I am very keen on this and I will repeat it uh, uh, again and again. I believe international financial institutions can play a critical role uh, here, the catalyst role that we need a lot in order to de-risking uh, some of the uh, projects uh, there. And uh, we hear from uh, some of them from time to time how important the clean energy investments are. But I think we should approach it from a more, in a more systematic way. And uh, I believe the, the, those uh, uh, governments, especially those from the advanced governments who sit in the boards of our inter international financial institutions should give a strategic uh, mandate to those countries to put the clean energy, mobilizing clean energy investment is a strategic priority. For me, if I have to pick up one thing, this is, uh, this is what I would pick up. Sorry, I wanna try and get in two more questions before we go yes. to, to Mike Waldron talk about the, the report. Yeah. Um, first one, uh, one of the ideas is there needs to be a, a strategic framework for investment. And that really is an internal policy reform in a lot of countries. Uh, one of the questions we got in advance of this meeting was from Peter Wooders, Wooders at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And he asked, how should we think about the role of state-owned enterprises in this? Are they usually in the way, usually crucial because they can make longer-term uh, investment risks? Are you seeing any patterns there or is it all over the map? I think there are mixed, uh, 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 is a, there's a mixed picture there. In some countries, SOEs can play a very positive role, to be honest with you, if they are well managed and if the government provides a clear policy and clear target there, given their uh, 
relatively deep pockets and able to look at the long-term issues, having a long-term vision, they can play a good uh, uh, positive role there. But in some countries, we see some of them are uh, uh, loss makers, uh, historical loss makers for uh, a bunch of reasons. And uh, it depends on the country, it depends on the governments, I should say. Yeah. Last question from me um, before we go to the panel which is um, about complements and conflicts. When, when people in the West talk about the energy transition, they really seem to mainly mean decarbonization, but there are a lot of other goals. And then one of the things you do in the report is analyze the impact of all this on electrification, on clean cooking. Where do you see these goals as complements and where do you see them as potentially in conflict with each other? So take, for example, clean cooking. A lot of people are excited about using LPG actually for clean cooking. Um, is there a way for us to think about this or is it mainly uh, we're going to see all these goals achieved at the same time? So for uh, for electrification, I mean, there are two hallmarks of that. One is the electric access to electricity. The second one is the clean cooking. For electricity access, I think a big chunk of the, uh, the new power plants can be run by the uh, clean uh, electricity sources. It can be solar, wind, hydropower, in my view, and, uh, and uh, others. There's a big chunk of, by the way, I should say, we are coming up with a major report on hydropower, the unforgotten, actually unforgotten uh, renewable energy, but it's very, very important, by the way, when you look at the numbers. So this is electricity. When it comes to clean cooking, uh, of course, there are many clean cooking uh, 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 options uh, here, including uh, sustainable uh, uh, bioenergy, but uh, I believe if there is a LPG to use going from the wood stoves to LPG, I will be uh, all for it uh, for a, a, at least a temporary solution because it is a, a, the climate change is important, but uh, the health of the women and children who are suffering from the respiratory diseases from the charcoal from wood is also uh, very important. And uh, once again, as I said, not all the countries are in the same basket. A sub-Saharan African country, European country, I cannot put them in the uh, same basket. So yes, for LPG in that uh, context for me. No, fair, fair enough. Just very quickly before, you, before we go to the next segment, um, it seems like on the one hand, the number of reports and the ambition of the reports uh, is going up almost every year. Now we're looking at net zero with all these studies. And yet, when you look at the real world, the ambition of policy is not, in, in some sense, even as we talk more about climate, the gap between what we're writing reports about and what's happening seems to be getting bigger. Is that helpful? So uh, I would say uh, more than the reports, the government commitments are, I mean, last, uh, this year, there is a record of two things, number of commitments uh, for net zero and the increase of global emissions. Both of them are at the record. This year, according to our numbers, global emission increase is the second largest in the history. And so are the, uh, the uh, number of commitments for to net zero. Of course, this is a big uh, growing gap between rhetoric and what is happening. But I should tell you that after uh, this, uh, we publish our, this trilogy, the, what I see in the real life from the companies, investors, uh, the civil society, it is an incredible momentum. Uh, and the momentum is not only in terms of political momentum, but also on the ground uh, in terms of the investments, increase, uh, increasing money in innovation. And I think we are in a, a, a positive uh, path uh, now, way, and I am really optimistic. Whether or not they ask me, can we reach 1.5? It is so difficult. Yes, it is extremely difficult. It is a narrow path. But we do everything we can to reach 1.5. If we can reach 1.5, if we reach 1.6, it is much better than three degrees Celsius. So therefore, I think we should take the 1.5 as our target, do everything what we can. And it is the reason that, as I told you, uh, David, I am very surprised with the, when our reports come. Our normal, uh, um, how should I say, counterparts are energy companies, energy ministries. We are dealing much more with, uh, since three weeks, with investors big investors, private investors, institutional investors, uh, and the pension funds, or civil society, 
uh, uh, treasuries. Uh, we normally talk with the energy ministries, but we are talking more with the treasuries uh, uh, there. And there is a, a great uh, momentum thanks to the work of many colleagues who are also joining to this meeting today, uh, you, David. And uh, I am uh, really optimistic despite this year's two records which are going in the opposite directions. Well, thank you very much for those uh, remarks and, and your point of optimism. And crucially, that we're si seeing signs of reality because finance ministers are involved and capital is involved. So Fatiba Roll, thank you very much. We're gonna see you again later at the panel discussion, but right now I wanna bring in our, our panel beginning with Mike Waldron, your colleague at the IEA, who is head of the Energy Investment Unit. That's the unit of IEA that did this report, um, uh, focusing in on, on, uh, on energy investment issues in emerging and developing countries. Uh, prior to being at IEA, Mike, uh, among other things, was at Lehman Brothers and on Wall Street, so knows the world of capital very well. Uh, and then our panel, I'm going to introduce the panel right now or, uh, uh, before Mike makes a few remarks about the IA uh, report. On our panel, we have Rachel Kite, who's the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School at uh, Tufts University, uh, a graduate of Tufts University, uh, previously was the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, which is an arm of the UN. It's been doing terrific work on uh, energy services for the least uh, developed populations. Uh, we have Steve Rothstein with us, who is the founding managing director of the uh, Series Accelerator for Sustainable Capital Markets Series, a terrific institution, a great friend of Brookings, I could say. Very helpful to us as we did our work on, on the capital markets and the impact of climate change on the capital markets. He's been doing a lot of work on how changes in regulatory policy could affect in the flow of capital. And, and previous to, uh, uh, to coming to a serious long career on energy, a variety of energy issues, including as one of the founders of Citizen Energy Corporation, which uh, provided energy services to, to many populations in need. We also have two of my colleagues at Brookings, uh, David Dollar, who's a senior fellow at the Thornton Center, an expert on China, um, was uh, uh, prior to coming to Brookings, was at the World Bank for many years and a whole series of postings throughout Asia, notably in, in China. And from 2009 to 2013 was the US Treasury Economic and Financial Envoy to China. And uh, Samantha Gross, uh, who is the fellow and director of energy security and the climate initiative uh, at the Brookings Institution. And among many other things prior to coming to Brookings was at the Department of Energy doing very important work on US uh, collaboration overseas, including in China and uh, Director of Integrated Research at IHS Ciro, very important think tank working on issues around energy. First, I wanna give the floor to Mike Waldron who's gonna say a few words about the report, a little more detail in the report. And then I'm gonna bring in the panelists to talk about that. So right now, the, Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. Uh, let me just pull up the presentation really quickly here. Okay, I hope this is visible to everybody. Uh, so in the next 10 minutes, That's I just good. wanted to um, build upon um, the executive director's opening remarks and illustrate and unpack some of the main messages of the report. Uh, so first I'd like to cover uh, what is exactly needed in terms of the investments, uh, then to look at the types of finance that are gonna be critical for financing clean energy transitions in these uh, economies, and then discuss a bit the priorities and cases that illustrate how to attract this capital in practice. Um, so it's worth keeping in mind at the outset that the geographical scope of this report, uh, when we're talking about emerging and developing economies, we're, we're broadly talking about the economies in Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, uh, developing and emerging Asia, uh, but we're not including China as, as part of this. So I know David noted that up front, but for those of you who just happen to be joining now, um, it's a good reminder in terms of the numbers. So building off of several years of effort in the IA, by the IA and tracking investments around the world as part of our World Energy Investment Report, uh, we have a pretty good sense of where the projects and the financial flows that characterize the energy investment landscape. Um, and what we've seen over the past five or so years is that clean energy investments in emerging and developing economies have been stuck at around $150 billion. Um, they declined by 8% in 2020. We expect only a slight rebound in 2021. Uh, the red dot there will show you the share of clean energy in total energy investment. And you can see this has been going up a bit, but I would say it's been going up more because of the weakness that we've seen in investment in fossil fuels and other parts outside of clean energy rather than particular strength in clean energy investment. When we're looking at what's needed in the decade ahead, uh, we, this points towards a massive surge in clean energy investment that would be needed 
uh, to put emissions on a different course. So to put the world on track to reach net zero emissions by 2050, um, annual capital spending on clean energy technologies. And this includes uh, a very big role for clean power technologies. So renewable power, including solar and wind, hydropower, um, but it also includes a very big role for investments in end use uh, on, in terms of energy efficiency and buildings and industry, uh, in terms of the um, spending on electrification of transport through electric vehicles um, and other sort of consumer level spending, um, spending that needs to take place. And also we see a small but growing role for investments in um, harder to abate sectors. So looking at the role of low carbon fuels and, and transitions for energy in intensive and emissions intensive industries. Um, putting it all together, clean energy investments over the next decade, we need to total over two thirds of the total investments. Um, and this is a, a far cry from where we are today, um, which is um, only around one quarter over the past five years. So, so a massive increase would be needed to put these economies on track. Now, when we're looking about how all this can be financed, uh, what we've done in this report uh, rather uniquely is start to analyze and project the sources of finance, the sources of the primary sources of finance. So these are the, the finance which is being used in the energy projects themselves um, and look at them over four different parameters. Um, so we've looked at what type of finance is needed by type of provider, uh, by type of instrument, um, the origin of the finance, and also by financing structure. And in this slide right here, we're looking at, we're, we're focusing on two of these parameters. Um, so the first parameter is looking at the role of the provider. So this is the role of a public versus private sources of finance. Um, and compared with advanced economies, uh, we see in emerging and developing economies that today's energy investments rely rather heavily on public sources of finance. So this is the uh, the light green portion to the right on the chart. Uh, even though this is still smaller than 50%, it's, it's a much higher share than in advanced economies. And this reflects some of the traditional challenges in attracting private capital and the role of state-owned enterprises um, in dominating certain sectors such as fuels. Um, we also look at the role of debt and equity, and we also find that energy investments in these economies are, are more funded by higher cost equity than, than debt. So this contributes to to a higher cost of capital overall. But when we're looking at the clean energy investments, and, and again, going back to this slide I showed just before, this very high stacked column of over $1 trillion, uh, we find that, in, and this is illustrated by the dot here on these charts, um, that the investment, the source of finance need to shift in order to be able to, um, to manifest these investments. So um, debt finance becomes more important as energy becomes more capital intensive and dependent on financing models with long-term cash flows and, and savings that support the bankability of projects. A low cost debt also becomes, a low cost local currency debt also becomes particularly important. And then on the top, we note that over 70% of the clean energy investments would need to come from private sources. So this runs the gamut from private developers to commercial banks to increased role of institutional investors. Um, and this very much characterizes the landscape, particularly in renewables and, and energy efficiency. Uh, despite these shifts, we still see an important role for public sources of finance, notably state-owned enterprises. They still remain very important in terms of um, infrastructure investment, uh, notably electricity networks. Um, equity risk capital still be, remains very important as well, particularly to fund new technologies and projects at early stages of development. And amid all this, even though we do see a, a larger role for private finance, um, what is really important is having that catalytic effect of public finance institutions to provide blended capital um, at the right time and in the right place to attract private investment um, in areas with hard to mitigate risks. So certain sectors or in markets or sectors at, at earlier stages of, of readiness for finance. So what is all this financing in, in terms of the sources of finance? What does it mean for the evolving um, energy system picture? So the, the finance matches up pretty well with the way the, the capital structure of the energy system is evolving. And this uh, in turn has an impact on the, the affordability of the transition. So the affordability of the transition starts to rely more on capital and it starts to rely more on the cost of capital. And we observe that as emerging and developing economies invest more in clean energy, uh, such as wind, solar PV, electric vehicles, as well as the enabling infrastructure for all these technologies, um, the energy system becomes more capital intensive. So it becomes more reliant on technologies which have higher upfront costs where financing plays a greater role in the overall cost of the transition. 
Um, but this shift towards a more capital intensive energy system is particularly challenging in geographies where capital has been constrained. And we'll get to this um, in, in, in the next slide actually. Um, and, but this slide, what it shows is it shows how this picture starts to play out in the, climate, in, the in the power sector in IEA climate driven scenarios. So overall looking ahead over the next decade, power supply costs rise by about half in emerging and developing economies. Um, but if you're looking at the, the charts on the right and you're looking at that share of the sort of dark green and the light green portion, um, you're gonna see that in a greater share of the overall costs of the power sector start to go towards increased investment in capital recovery for renewables and electricity networks in particular. And at the same time, even though the total costs are going up and even though the operating costs are also going up, um, you're seeing a relatively smaller share of those operating costs in the total costs. And an analysis we did in the report, and it's not shown here on the slide, but we took the power sector and the end use sector together. So looking at industry transport and, and buildings plus power. And we looked at the total cost of transition. And when you tally up the increased investments, the increased financing costs, but then you net off some of the operational savings, you see that the total cost of transition is only around 5% higher um, than under the current development pathway under today's policy setting. So um, the cost of the transition is actually quite manageable, but it's really securing that upfront capital, uh, which is the very difficult part, and which is partly why we, we wrote this book. So this picture right here will show you on a very kind of indicative basis, um, some of the difficulties in securing capital in, in different parts of the world, or, the difficulties in securing it, but also the cost associated with that. So globally, and, and I'm sure all the, the panelists would agree with this, global, global capital is, is rather abundant right now. Um, there's a good uh, financial conditions or accommodative in many parts of the world, um, and interest rates are rather low, and capital is, is abundant in, in places, uh, particularly in advanced economies. Um, but we see there's a big difference in the cost around the world. And over the past few years, Economy-wide financing costs have broadly come down as government bond yields have come down, equity market risk premia have also come down um, in a number of economies around the world, both advanced economies and emerging market and developing economies. But looking at this picture and what this picture shows you is, is basically the base rates. So it shows you the government bond yields plus the market risk premia. So this is kind of the starting point for the cost of capital, not necessarily the specific cost of capital that you would find for a, for a, given, pro for a given project, which is uh, determined by some of the risks associated with the particular project or that particular energy sector. Um, and what we find is that up to seven times more expensive in some of the emerging and developing economies um, is the cost of capital. When you're looking at more risky markets or even looking at more risky segments within a market. So for example, looking at um, small and medium sized enterprises, uh, the cost of capital can be much higher than, than the seven times we show here. This is just gives you kind of an indicative um, economy-wide difference between the advanced economies um, and the emerging economies. Um, and this picture is not getting better, even though that we've seen the cost of capital broadly come down. Um, we see that domestic savings continue to be unevenly distributed across regions uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, debt burdens are on the rise in a number of emerging and developing economies. Uh, when we look at over 90% of the investment needs that we put out in this report for emerging and developing economy, over 90% are occurring in economies with underdeveloped banking systems and capital markets um, when we're looking at the global average. Um, so this is a persistent challenge and it points to a relatively high bar for investments in accessing debt finance and meeting equity return hurdle rates uh, before even getting to, to the energy sector. So this is kind of the, the starting conditions. Um, this also means that good energy policy reforms and targeted financial me mechanisms are really critical um, to start to overcome this, this starting imbalance. And in my final slide, I'm just going to point out um, you know, the how, so how we can actually make this happen, how we can actually start to attract capital um, at scale to these economies and the sectors that are needed for clean energy transitions. Um, so as, as the executive director uh, pointed out, we have uh, around 50 case studies and examples um, in the book where we're talking about how this is done pragmatically. Um, in the executive summary of the book, we set out 20 priority actions, and these priority actions are kind of grouped into four buckets, which I'm going to briefly show here and give a few examples. Um, the first bucket of this is really recognizing that an international catalyst is needed to boost clean energy investment in emerging and developing economies. Um, it's about giving a strong strategic mandate to, to um, uh, international public finance institutions. It's about 
boosting and improving the delivery of international climate finance um, with targeted use of blended finance to help mobilize additional private capital. But both the international community and emerging and developing economies um, need to address a number of other issues. And some of these are cross-cutting, some of these are spe sector specific um, that help to get investments moving. And just to briefly give you a sample of these um, that we have in the book, when you're thinking about some of the cross-cutting investment issues that affect all projects, um, we looked at cases and examples of how to make it easier to prepare clean energy projects with financing facilities and things called one-stop shops, um, as in Morocco and India. Um, we looked at the financial performance of utilities and how do you enhance those because they play a crucial part in all sorts of transactions um, that are electricity related, both in supply and demand. And we looked at case studies in Colombia and Kenya on that. Um, pushing to the third bucket right here on clean power and efficiency, um, we looked at how to harness investor readiness to back renewable power um, with competitive procurement frameworks in Argentina and Brazil. Um, we looked at ways to embed efficiency in all new buildings and appliances, um, analyzing some of the programs in, new Mexi in, in Mexico and South Africa. Um, and we also looked at ways to promote more electrified and efficient mobility as in Thailand and Uganda. And then last, this sort of getting to grips with the toughest tasks, this points to um, how do you finance transitions in the fuel supply sector and emissions intensive sectors? Um, this involves recasting the development model of oil and gas producer economies, as well as laying the groundwork for the scale up of low emissions fuels and, and, and emissions intensive industries. And there we, we looked at a number of cases ranging from uh, Egypt to Bangladesh um, to, to Singapore, to looking at the cement industry worldwide on how to do this. And of course, there's a number of other cases in the book ranging from um, boosting electricity access and clean cooking to uh, boosting investment in smart grids and in addressing the emissions of existing coal power assets. Um, so the last takeaway I'll leave you with is that the investment opportunity is actually huge in these economies, um, despite some of the upfront challenges with the cost of capital. Um, this opportunity has to do with the creation of new jobs associated with clean energy investments and some of the related activities. But it's also important as we're looking at this transition um, to make sure governments to make sure this clean energy transition is people centered and inclusive because it also involves the transition away um, from some existing industries and fossil fuels, um, which have heretofore been a, 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 a big source of employment in a number of these economies. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, David. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And and uh, I want to bring in the rest of the panel right now. And um, that's a big list. <laughs> Last slide. Four buckets, a lot of stuff in every bucket. Maybe I'm going to start with the questions to Rachel Kayed and Steve Rothstein um, about the first bucket to you, Rachel, which is about international support. We just had the G7 meeting, come and go. There are new pledges, um, not really a plan, but a pledge to have a plan for more investment finance, partly in reaction to what's happening with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, financed by China. I'm curious, just as someone who's watched this area and been in the center of this area for, for a long time, Rachel, what do you see coming out in terms of new international frameworks that could really help address the problem at the scale that, that Mike and Fatih talked about, which is a 7x increase in investment for clean energy finance? Yeah, thank you, uh, David. It's good to be here today, and it's it's good to welcome IEA into the space. Um, you know, based on on their analytics of what what actually has to happen in the transition, then what happens needs to happen on the finance. And I think the, there's nothing to argue about really on the slides that have been presented. But I think the important question is why has it not happened? Because the investment returns really are there, and the and the need is urgent. And I would. You know, we're on a panel, so I mean, we're not. I don't think any of us really disagree, but just you know, to keep the conversation lively. I mean, I, I'm not sure that the MDBs need a strategic mandate. They have that. It's called the Paris Agreement. Um, I think the question is why is public finance not being used um, aggressively enough, um, and what what uh, is going to happen now that we different to meet the delta between where we are and where we need to be as was so well uh, described by, uh, by IEA colleagues. And so I think there are, there's a couple of paragraphs of sort of warm milk in the G7 communique. One, uh, but they're important. One is that the actual, the MDBs have to do a lot better with what they've already got. And I'll come to that. And then the second is um, the MDBs have to explain if they were to get more, uh, what they would do with more resources, more capital. So first off, um, 
Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of public money sitting in bilateral pockets and in the multilateral banks and in different pockets within the different multilateral banks that could be used much more uh, effectively. Uh, and this means answering the questions about why the MDBs don't leverage private sector finance better than they do at the moment. They've been under pressure to do this for a good couple of decades um, and have had really fairly poor results. I think, um, you know, whether you look at IBRD, IDA, we look at even at IFC, you know, but there are ways in which uh, the MDBs have leveraged very effectively. And I was also glad to see in the G7 communique that finally more funding is going to flow into the climate investment funds, for example, where there is a very good track record of leveraging at least one to seven, one to ten. So the question is, you know, what do they need to do with their existing rules and what do shareholders need to do to be good shareholders um, to allow more risk to be taken, different risk to be taken, risk to be taken in a different way? How should their treasury operations uh, move? Um, what should they be doing in these new country plans that are part of the uh, climate uh, plan and climate strategy that we're waiting to see the detail of out of the bank? And then for the IFC and for the private sector oriented parts of the multilateral development banks, you know, if we're going to go to scale, then they have to be able to originate uh, an extraordinary pipeline of projects, which then need to be moved off their balance sheets onto the balance sheets of the private sector. I think expecting Goldman Sachs and others to start walking around, you know, the Sahel looking for renewable energy projects to invest in isn't going to happen anytime soon. So how do we originate and distribute and how do we use the balance sheets of the MDBs and the development finance and uh, bilateral IDFC members in an effective way. So these are all questions I think that have to be answered. And I think there is gonna be political pressure on the MDBs to be able to show how they could do more with what they've already got before they get more capital. And I think the Western shareholders are clearly lined up to give them more capital, but are gonna to want to see an aggression that hasn't been there up to now. And then I think there are real questions about how developing countries access the capital markets for debt at a reasonable price. At the moment, they can go, with, and I think Vera Songway at the Economic Commission on Africa has spoke, spoken the most compellingly about this, but um, that's going to have to happen. And then I think there's also going to be a need for domestic resources to be spent on the energy transition. So for many countries, especially those countries with the biggest energy access gaps, there's very little in, um, indigenous capital going into uh, the opportunities for high investment returns uh, in sort of the energy access space in these countries. So I could say many more things, but I'll let my fellow panelists uh, jump in. Um, but uh, I think the question is, um, if we've had low interest rate environments for a very long time, the MDBs have had a mandate for a time. There's a sense of urgency now. There is a sense of being in this race to zero. And I agree with Fatih. It's not, you know, it's a race against time. Everybody has to cross the line. What's going to have to change in the instruction from shareholders and what will have to change in the way the current rules that are used by the MDBs and the current constraints that they have, that's going to have to change if the MDBs are going to unleash uh, public investment and then a wave of leveraged private investment uh, into the transition quickly. Great, thank you very much. So what I wanna do is put the inverse of this very same topic to Steve Rothstein. Rachel laid out the argument in effect that the multilateral development banks, the MDBs have had the mandate for a long time and there's more capital ready to go. And I'm, I wanna bring in David Dollar later on the same, same point, including China's role and all this. But first I wanna talk with you, Steve, about the role of the private capital markets because it seems like there's a huge amount of capital now looking for returns, but also looking for returns that in various ways is environment, social governance, ESG related returns. Isn't this an ideal opportunity for them or is this being seen by the capital markets as, as a horror show because the risks are so great and the currency risks and the governance risks and the list kind of goes on and on and on. Yeah, so I think, you know, as H.L. Mencken said, for every complex answer, there's a simple answer. Every complex question, there's a simple answer that's always wrong. So there is no one, but they're writing. First is the complexities of, of loaning or developing in emerging countries clearly exist. Then add on top of it, the uncertainty of the regulatory structure is true. And then on some of these technologies that are proven, no question, and some of them are newer. So there are all those risks. And there is a 
uh, I can give you kind of the glass half full and the glass half empty part of it. The glass half full is in the last year, series and lots of other partners around the world have worked with investors and there are $37 trillion of, in, of investors, investors who have said they want their capital to be net zero by 2050. They're gonna set short-term goals by 2030. And there's a lot of work being done. The three largest in, in the US have all signed on to this, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. So there is a lot of capital that will be moving in this area. Um, the banks, have, the six largest banks have also said that they will be doing the same kinds of things. So there's a lot of great efforts. There's also regulatory pressure, some that's starting and some that's gonna move on. I'm gonna talk more about the regulatory stuff in a minute. The glass half empty is, if you look at since Paris, banks have loaned $2.7 trillion more. The, the 35 largest banks, $2.7 trillion more than they had before Paris. So even in the last several years in Paris, we, we, the capital hasn't moved as quickly. Uh, while there's been a growth, every bank has a ESG fund and there's more funds going into solar and wind and the cost of those have gone down depending on the technology from 70 to 90%. So there's a lot of great news. But there's also other, other news. And some people have described this in the banks is, you know, if you're on a diet, talk about the salad you eat, but forget to mention about the ice cream you had for dessert. Um, so there's still a lot of these areas. So, so there is great ambition. There is a lot of great work happening. It has accelerated in the last year, um, but we are still at ground zero. And just following up on what the executive director said, you know, climate's one of those areas, David, you know this so well, that if you win slowly, we all lose. And so we all have to move faster. Private capital, there is enormous capital available, but the uh, investors and the banks have to now take their initial statements and make them into concrete science-based 2030 plans and use those uh, in, in a way to invest both here and around the world. Great, thank you very much. I wanna bring in David Dollar next and then Samantha and David, I wanna, pick up on a theme that Rachel brought in front of us, which is the, multi, the Western multilateral development banks already have a mandate. And at the same time, the Chinese government and Chinese state-owned firms through the Belt and Road Initiative have been doing a huge amount of investment. In some sense, there's like an arms race underway uh, right now that's triggering more investment from the West. And so I'm just curious as, as someone who's been in one of the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, and also studies China, uh, two related questions. One of them is, do you agree with Rachel's characterization that the mandate's already there and in some sense, this is folks just need to get on with it. And how do you see the Belt and Road, the BRI initiative and the kind of arms race of financing that's been triggered by that? Is that basically in the end gonna be very helpful to mobilizing more of this international capital or is it getting in the way? Thank you very much, David. So I very much agree with Rachel's point that the multilateral development banks already have this mandate you know, they've had it for a long time. I retired more than 10 years ago. And, you know, we were deeply involved in this 15, 20 years ago. So it is a question of just getting on with it. And I do think one important issue is the World Bank in particular and the other multilateral banks, they continue to be bureaucratic, you know, difficult to deal with. They have lots of complicated regulations. You know, I ran the largest infrastructure program in the World Bank, which was the China portfolio. And, you know, we just had hundreds and hundreds of pages of regulations. Um, and so I think, frankly, a lot of developing countries really don't like doing big infrastructure projects with the existing multilateral banks. You know, on the other hand, China can move very quickly. Uh, and that has both, you know, pros and cons. Uh, I, I think some competition between the traditional funding sources and the Chinese, I think that that's potentially a healthy thing. A lot of developing countries welcome that. Uh, quite a bit of research shows that the Belt and Road Initiative is demand driven. And so one of the important issues is what do developing countries want? If developing countries make a strong push to set and meet ambitious commitments on carbon reduction, you know, then they're gonna be demanding from China, you know, hydro, for example, China is a major financer of hydro, China is a major financer of solar, uh, but China is also a major financer of coal-fired plants because uh, 
countries with coal reserves are asking Chinese to finance these. So, you know, I think one thing we have to do is, is get developing countries, you know, on board with the commitments and understanding how important this is for them. And then I also think we can use, I, where I do think the development banks, the traditional donors are good is in technical assistance. You know, as you know, the access of periodic sources to the grid is, is complicated. It's not a simple thing to develop a solar industry where you don't have a solar industry. Uh, so we could imagine uh, the complementarity between these different financing sources where World Bank provides technical assistance you know, to help develop renewable uh, you know, technologies and some of that will end up being financed by China and that's fine as long as that's actually getting done. But so I think it's, um, you know, it's useful to have this G7 talk about uh, you know, new sources of financing and ramping up and development banks taking this seriously. But I don't think we should see this as an anti-China initiative. I think that'll be self-defeating and not particularly welcome in most of the developing world. Just quickly, quick follow up on this. Uh, Rachel mentioned these country studies, country programs that are, are now designed to kind of create more strategic view of what can and should happen inside individual countries. And we've seen in earlier, earlier efforts around multilateral development assistance, for example, in the ozone layer where country studies have a very, very crucial role. Do you, are you optimistic that that kind of initiative is exactly what's needed to get the Western MDBs to be playing a more strategic and complementary role or is the jury out on that issue? No, I think that could be very useful. That's, that's another good example of what the multilateral banks do well you know, which is country studies and sector studies. And so kind of mapping out what this energy sector in Pakistan will have to look like, or Indonesia. I mean, let's face it, most of the emissions come from a small number of big countries. So if you just take the developing countries that are in the G20, you know, that, that's a big share of growing emissions right there. And so you should be able to trace out what the energy sector is going to look like. Uh, and, and uh, you know, that can be very useful in galvanizing public opinion and political momentum. Yeah, let me go to you uh, next, Rachel. Uh, I'm sorry, Samantha. Um, you've been in Germany for the last half year or so. I think you're in Mexico today, global traveler. We're all on Zoom. Um, I'm curious, it seems like there's a tension in any discussion of global decarbonization between <clears throat> what the leaders wanna do, which tend to be wealthier countries willing to spend gazillion dollars on various things, and the need for this to be a global, everyone needs to cross the finish line and Fatih's metaphor. Um, how are you seeing the balance of effort between inside Europe, the, the efforts to control emissions in Europe versus putting more money into international finance, uh, helping the MDBs steer in a more effective way along the lines of what Rachel was talking about? Is the balance of effort out of whack? Uh, are, are these international issues a much bigger deal in Europe than they are here in the United States? Help us understand that. Thank you, David. Most of the people that I spoke to when I was in Germany were really focused on getting their own house in order. And I think that's because they've put forward their new goals. They're working on what they're calling the Fit for 55 program, which is putting in place the policies that will allow them to achieve their Paris goal, which is a 55% reduction by 2030 on greenhouse gas emissions. And so what I heard mostly was a real focus on what's going on at home. But something I also heard that I haven't heard the other panelists talk about that I think Europe is doing is that they're working on reducing the cost of capital by helping countries establish policies that, that make that policy risk smaller. If you think about why the cost of capital is so high in many of these countries, policy risk is an important aspect of that. And so I see Europeans reaching out. I see quite a bit of work with China, which I know isn't included in this study, but other countries as well, helping them establish carbon markets, helping them think about how to put in place enabling policy to enable clean energy investment. And so that's something that can reduce the cost of capital and reduce the risk of these investments. Um, as others have said, there's tons of money out there that's looking for high returns with interest rates and the cost of capital are very low here in the wealthy world. And so reducing policy risk is something that can enable investments in other countries. And we've certainly seen what can happen when that policy risk takes place. I'm sitting here in Mexico today, 
And that's an area where policy risk has been really important with the change in the presidency here. We've seen a real just complete drawing up of the environment for clean energy investments because of a change in policy. And so that's an area where I see the Europeans reaching out and doing a lot of good work to actually reduce one of those risks to make clean energy investment more possible and also more profitable. Let me come back to you, Mike. Um picking up on a very important point that Samantha's made about policy risk, because it seems like this is maybe a little abstract as a question, but a little abstraction is, is the name of the game as for university professor. Um, I'm curious, it, it seems like on the one hand, the report is full of examples of all kinds of policy reforms that are needed, especially internal to countries. And on the other hand, the more the things change, the greater the risks often and therefore the greater the cost of capital. And you have some very powerful calculations showing that even modest changes in the cost of capital, 50, 100, 200 basis points, can have this huge impact on the overall cost of decarbonization. So I'm curious as to how we should think about what are the right models for doing all of that policy reform, yet taking seriously the idea that if, if investors see a lot of policy change, they're gonna see policy risk. And, and that's uh, anathema to low cost of capital. Yeah, and so just to kind of put it in context a bit and, and kind of stepping back and looking at the, the overall investment opportunity while taking the cost of capital into account. So I think it's worth uh, keeping in mind that in a lot of emerging and developing economies, some of the emissions reductions opportunities we see are the most affordable in the world. So they are quite cost effective. Some of the before you get to the cost of capital, the capital costs, so the costs of the projects and the technologies, et cetera. In some markets, these are among the lowest of the world. Solar PV in, in India is a very good example. Um, so looking at it from an, an overall investment uh, opportunity from kind of an affordability or a com competitiveness standpoint, uh, there are a lot of really good opportunities there, even though you do see this differential in cost of capital. And this differential can be prohibitive in the sense that it's not just about influencing the project economics, it can be binary in the sense that you can't even get financing for these projects in certain markets to begin with. And we looked at cost of capital through a number of different lenses in the report. And the, the slide I showed you is just looking at kind of the, the starting point. So the market-wide cost of capital before you get to the energy sector. And then we've also looked at how do you look at that kind of risk premia for certain sectors. So as Samantha was saying that things associated with policy risk, um, we looked at that, for example, in, in solar PV. And we also looked at a number of sensitivities of how project economics evolve with changing cost of capital, ranging from projects in green buildings to uh, carbon capture, utilization and storage to the ownership of electric vehicles. And so it, it is an issue of the differentials between the different markets, between the advanced and the emerging and developing economies, but it's also this issue of different segments within those markets. So. Um, access to finance for smaller scale investments or for new technologies is always going to be more constrained um, than for the more mature, uh, more mature stamp, more mature technologies. So all of this kind of um, upfront barriers puts more onus on combining a some enhanced role for catalytic finance, uh, particularly from the international community, and b some sort of good policy reforms, um, which can also be supported by the international community as well. And we've seen investment ramp up in certain clean energy technologies and markets which could be challenging on their own to invest in um, when the right frameworks are put in place. I mean, the, the examples of solar PV and wind are always the, the easiest or always the sort of most ready um, in countries like Vietnam or even in countries like Egypt or in Uzbekistan, where they've started to set um, transparent auction frameworks around bankable contracts um, when they've been able to kind of use uh, blended finance from both uh, national public finance sources and international public finance sources. And even though these markets can still be difficult to do business in, um, just putting in place those sort of hived off frameworks around these technologies have been uh, major ways to attract capital. So this is a success story and, and the challenge is to be able to scale these frameworks both within those economies and then to bring them to new economies. Um, and then you also have the issue of some of the sectors which are less mature or less developed um, efficiency technologies are mature from a technology standpoint, um, but oftentimes the business model is challenging and the access to consumer finance projects are, are challenging. Um, and so they're having a better rollout of policies to support, for example, building standards and green loan programs for, for, for mortgages and, and efficiency upgrades um, is important. When you're looking at new technologies, 
um, you're going to have to have governments step in oftentimes and take those first risks for first of a kind projects or public financial institutions to come in and bear a lot of that risk um, for financing these on, on concessional terms just to get those first projects going. Um, and these are things like CCUS or, or hydrogen, which we don't see much of right now and the business models aren't viable right now in these economies, but would expect to play a, good, a, a big role over the next decade. Um, and it's just worth keeping in mind that despite all these challenges in terms of attracting and the cost of finance, um, the growth opportunities are there for investors. These are also some of the fastest growing economies in terms of economic growth and demand over the next decade. Um, and so putting that onus on better energy policy reforms, building capacity at the local level to develop projects and supporting this with catalytic finance from the international system um, can be a good way to kind of scale these and move these things forward all at once. Let me ask you, I, uh, we have about 10 minutes left. I wanna make sure we have time for, for a few more questions. I wanna go first to Rachel. Um, Mike laid out a whole bunch of innovation that's occurred around uh, you know, auctions for renewable power, a lot of things that are about decarbonization. I'm curious, given your previous job as running Sustainable Energy for All, SE for All, whether you see the same degree of innovation around clean cooking and electrification, or in some sense, those missions are lagging behind the attention to the decarbonization of mission. Should we be worried about that? No, I, I think it, it depends on where you stand, right? Um, so if you're if you're sitting in in you know in a major city town in 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 an emerging market, you don't have reliable, affordable, clean energy, um, and let alone for all. And so you're worried about the cost of capital. You're worried about the indigenization of uh, working capital debt. You're worried about the depth and breadth of your own capital markets. You're worried about going to the international markets. You're worried about the bond markets. Then you're worried about the incumbency and the inertia. You've probably got a um, utility which is not solvent and maybe weakly managed. Uh, you've got you know, international gas companies and their lobbyists walking through the door because they're not making money in the global north anymore. Um, you've got politicians who remember how energy used to be done, and now you're saying it's going to be decentralized, decarbonized, digitalized. This is a whole new world. And you've got MDBs giving you different advice depending on who you call on any given day. And then you've got bilateral Western aid coming in and sort of, you know, having 14,000 angels dancing on the head of a pin with lots of sort of perfect and maybe not enough of the good. And then you've got China and then you're going to have India. And so I think you have to look at this from the bottom up and you have to look at uh, tackling the inertia and the incumbency, which mean that you can't have the imagination that we can have a green hydrogen market offshore in Africa, the inertia and the incumbency, which are going to stop you imagining that you can actually have Chinese and Asian off takers for large scale renewable energy uh, projects in Africa. So that Africa actually, because it has abundant, basically free energy, if you get it right, could not only electrify itself, but could actually be the, you know, the power generator for the aluminum of the future, the new steel of the future, et cetera. So we're going to have to think big and think different. And then, um, yeah, and then on the developed world side, I think if we projectize access to energy for all, we'll never get there. Uh, I'm chair of the Rwandan Green Fund. And let me tell you that, you know, these kinds of domestic uh, green funds and development banks uh, are on the, on, on the rise. And the whole purpose of them is that they check every box. They're well administered. They're well uh, governed. They uh, are good enough to get access to the Green Climate Fund and every other possible international mechanism. And so they should and they have plans. They, have, they relate to the nationally determined contributions, which are Paris compliant. So in that case, you should be putting development money into those funds and letting then those funds be used against the pro domestic priorities. But let me tell you what still happens is you have a set of domestic priorities. In the case of Rwanda, they have a very clear roadmap about how they're going to get clean cooking for everybody. And you still have to deal with a Western donor that's like, well, no, we really want to see this kind of safeguard on this kind of policy you know, and therefore we're going to have to have our money put in a separate pot of money where it can't be contaminated with somebody else's money because we couldn't possibly fund LPG in a city or town. In so if we're going to projectize this, then come back in 2040 and David Dollar and I will be saying the same thing. Right. So I, I think we have a we we have to sort of 
let the urgency sort of wash its way through the development finance um, industry. Um, I'm optimistic there is extraordinary innovation out there. Um, Sebastian Kind at Green Map is putting a sort of policy uh, recipe kit in a box, given what he did in Argentina when Argentina put their auctions out. So there's plenty of people who know a little bit about how this can be done. Uh, but I think we're going to have to organize the technical assistance differently as well as the capital from MDBs. Um, so there's technical capacity around the world, but is it deployed in a way that can really be useful? I think that's probably room for innovation there as well. Let me ask, uh, since you said you and David Dollar can be saying the same thing in 2040, I want to get David Dollar on the record to see whether indeed he's saying <laughs> the same thing in 2040. And in particular, Rachel laid out, you know, need to think big. We have a lot of the frameworks there. And yet, when we go to implementation, we're mucking it up. Um, the money that's pledged through the G7 most recently maybe adds up to $100 billion. Nothing like the trillion, trillion and a half that's needed for Mike's analysis and so on. So what, what happens if we continue to kind of bump along and projectize everything, projectize everything or whatever the verb is? Um, and do, does... Do we just don't deliver? Does the Chinese program get bigger? How should we think about that geopolitically, David? Well, I think the Chinese program pulled back a little bit in the last few years, you know, partly because there have been some failures and obviously the pandemic had a big effect. But I don't expect the Chinese program long-term to be diminished. I think it's gonna be on the rise now uh, and the rational thing is for us to be coordinating with that and trying to help developing countries get the most out of it. Uh, I, I don't. I think we don't don't look serious, you know, when we talk about a hundred billion dollar initiative, given the, the scale of the problem. It does seem there's a reasonable chance, David, that we'll, you know, kind of muddle around for a while, and then it'll become increasingly clear that we're not going to be meeting key targets. You know, I would like to think that, you know, as various <clears throat> climate disasters unfold, that that does affect politics uh, and that we will eventually wake up. But it does, you know, I come back to the point made uh, in the initial presentation that there seems to be divergence between commitments general vague rhetorical commitments and then what's actually happening in terms of investment and carbon emissions. Yeah. I'm shocked because it's never happened in any other area of politics where it's a disconnect between what people say it actually not being something it's not. Let me ask you, Steve, um, about net zero. Um, really appreciated your earlier comments about how the private markets are seeing risk, even as you have so much money flowing into ESG. And I'm curious as to whether, ironically, all the focus on net zero might be getting in the way of some of the things that Mike and Fatsi have been talking about, in part because so many of these economies still have coal in their economies and still are going to have coal for the foreseeable future or other fossil fuel for the, future, for the foreseeable future. And so net zero seems kind of like a fantasy, whereas what we really care about is deep reductions in emissions and whether we, it's actually zero or not maybe getting in the way. And I'm just curious as to whether you're seeing any evidence of that kind of wariness by investors about getting involved in emerging economies and so on precisely because they don't know what's going to happen to their overall net zero pledges? Or is that a smokescreen? I think there are a few things. First is one of the sectors, and it's small in the context, uh, but important is, is, is philanthropy. Just today, um, IKEA and Rockefeller announced a billion dollar fund. And they've specifically said, again, small numbers compared to the issue, but it's going to be catalytic and risk capital. So that's important just to keep that in mind. In terms of net zero, absolutely. I mean, we can't, we, we can't allow these projects to continue with fossil fuel, particularly coal, and then let people plant trees. I mean, I've already seen plans that, you know, we'll, we'll, we would plant trees the size of Brazil seven times over, speaking of the word number seven. So the, and we just did a recent report on natural climate solutions where basically is the offsets have to only be used in the last resort. The first thing we have to do and the second thing and the third thing, it's like in real estate, it's location, location, location. And this it's reduction, reduction, reduction. And then only later using offsets. So the net has to be a smaller end, not larger. The other element to think about is bank regulations. I mean, you know, that there's some work in Europe already and, we, and we're working hard in, in the US on this. 
to try to affect the cost of capital with with uh, 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 stress test and scenario analysis, then would make the cost of capital for fossil fuels a lot higher and the cost for renewables a lot lower as part of this. Thank you, that's really helpful. I'm curious, uh, we're just, just about out of time here, but I wanna um, come back to you, Samantha, about the future and in particular the, the role of European policy initiative because um, Europeans frankly have been the leaders in this area. So I'm curious as to whether, as you see more attention to the international trade effects, international investment effects from European policy, we're about to see a border uh, carbon adjustment plan elements of it have already been leaked, a um, bunch of other things. Do you see the future uh, of European policy and therefore pressure on American policy to include more of these international investment kinds of questions? Or do you think that as countries get more serious about decarbonization, they are gonna continue basically look inward at, at their own house? I think that you do see European policy pushing reductions abroad, um, particularly through trade policy. The carbon border adjustment mechanism um, will be difficult to implement, but on the other hand, it is primarily designed to protect European industry, but at the same time, it gives Europe a mechanism through which to help industries and other countries decarbonize. And I think this is a way that Europe could use its own policy to reach out and help other countries decarbonize their own industries. I also completely agree that the European Banking Initiative will help. You see what they call the taxonomy in Europe that's focused on deciding what investments are green and what investments are not. And so as European banks look to fulfill their customers' demands, government demands for greener investments, and they turn to this taxonomy, I think that will really help European commercial banks and other commercial investors um, understand what investments are green and to encourage more of them. The one sort of slight um, cloud to this silver lining is, some, is going back to something that Rachel said about um, you don't want perfect to be the enemy of the good. And I think that's my bigger concern with European policy is that there's so much focus on green perfection that we perhaps may miss out on the good and miss out on things like LPG and cooking because it's a fossil fuel and that sort of thing. So I, I'm really excited about a lot of the things that Europe is doing, but, but one real challenge to their policies are um, unlike the sort of get it done policy that we have here in the United States and you know, we like all solutions. Um, Europe is more focused on the perfect solution and I hope that that doesn't cloud their approach to investments abroad where get it done is really what needs to happen. Yeah, that's very, uh, very good advice. Seems to me that you know, trade measures are going to be part of the story, but the more, just to pick up on something that really began with Fatih's opening comments, the more we see this through the lens of investment policy um, and the factors that condition where capital flows, I think the more serious we're going to be about, about this. Uh, we didn't have a chance to talk very much today about electricity, but I just want to underscore something that's in what's new in the IA report is they're running their energy models um, uh, with much greater detail around investment and how factors affect the cost of capital and the allocation of equity and debt, and therefore ultimately what kinds of projects are developed and really the rubber meets the road around electricity. Electricity is the center. It's not the only story, but the electricity is the key part of this. Well, I, I hope everyone will join me in thanking uh, both on our panel, uh, Mike Waldron, Rachel Kite, uh, Steve Rothstein, David Dollar, and Samantha Gross, and also for his earlier remarks um, uh, from Fati Barol and the whole team at IEA, a really terrific discussion. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.